Hi, my name is Joe Kittinger. Um, I had a 29 year career in the United States Air Force. Um, and then I had another uh, 40 years uh, since then that I've been flying. And I, right now I have 16,800 hours of flying in uh, 93 different types of aircraft. But like everyone's profession, it starts when you, as you're a youth. Uh, most people set their goals when they're youth. Uh, I, I had a very loving mother and father that uh, uh, gave me the guidance and the love that uh, a boy needs. Uh, they, uh, my father wanted to make certain that I could uh, take care of myself. And uh, he encouraged me to be in the Boy Scouts and uh, encouraged me to be able to, to take care of myself in any environment. So I did a lot of camping and uh, living out uh, in nature. Uh, and they, it kind of gives you the self-confidence in yourself to be able to survive any environment. Uh, early on in my life, uh, I, I became interested in, in aviation. Uh, even before I started uh, school, I was thinking about flying. And uh, I made, built model, model airplanes and I, I would fly them and then I'd build another one. And uh, I, I read everything I could read about it about aviation, and uh, that, that became my goal early on, uh, very early on in my life. And uh, there was any doubt in my mind what I wanted to do, and uh, it kept getting reinforced as I got older. And uh, I went to the University of Florida after I graduated uh, from high school, and uh, at those days you had to have two years of college before you could enter the uh, aviation cadets. So as soon as I had two years, of the, uh, successful college career at the University of Florida, I went down to the uh, recruiting office, Air Force recruiting office, and I said to the sergeant that I wanted to be a pilot, and he said, well, uh, right now uh, we have, the program is on hold, but uh, you can uh, join as enlisted man and uh, apply to, for pilot training later on. I said, well, no, I don't want to go that route. I, I, I think I'd wait. I'll wait now until there's a, the program is, is refinanced in the Air Force uh, because I, I want to go through the aviation that program, and if I don't make it, I want to come back and go into other aviation, uh, maybe the airlines. I'm not sure yet, but I, I don't want to be stuck in the Air Force as an enlisted man for uh, four years. So uh, this was in 1948. I got a notice that I was then selected for the aviation that program, and in March of 1949, I uh, went uh, by a train and bus to uh, San Angelo, Texas, where I started my aviation cadet training. Um, I was so fortunate because my instructor had been in World War II. He had flown P-51s, and uh, the first day we met each of the, his students that he was going to instruct, uh, he told us his career and how much he loved the P-51. And uh, he said, if you're going to be a fighter pilot, uh, you ought to start off in the P-51 because that's a great airplane. And we're going to jets anyway uh, downstream. So uh, you should have had an opportunity to fly the P-51. That was the very first day of my introduction to my instructor. Uh, he was a wonderful instructor. And uh, after 13 hours, uh, I soloed in the T-6 Texan, uh, and I had flown, by the way, uh, Piper Cubs uh, as, as a youth before I got to the University of Florida. Uh, a friend of mine was a, a pilot, and he would take me up in a float plane and let me take it off and land it, and uh, I had a lot of, awful lot of fun uh, in the early, before I even got into the Air Force. I did not have a pilot's license yet, but I, I knew how to fly anyway. But now I... Uh, but going through the T-6 training in the six months, uh, I, I was very high up in my class. And uh, we had a choice where we could go. There were three choices you could make. You could go to, if you want to go multi-engine, you, you went to a B-25. And if you wanted to be a fighter pilot, you had two choices. There's the F-80s at Williams Air Force Base, which was just starting in that, uh, that year. And then there was P-51s at Nellis Air Force Base. Uh, I, uh, I opted for the P-51 because uh, my instructor had told me how much he loved it and, 
they told me that uh, I would for sure go to Jets anyway, so why not do it? So I went to Ellis Air Force Base and uh, spent six months in the P-51 and graduated in March of uh, 1950. I was assigned uh, uh, to uh, a fighter unit in Germany flying P-47s, uh, Thunderbolt, and uh, I went there in, uh, in Germany, in Neuburg, Germany, and checked out the P-47, and I, I loved it. And I became combat ready in the aircraft, and then in November of 1959, we got F-84E's airplanes, and uh, now I was flying jets. Um, and then a year later, we flew, started flying F-86s, and uh, I was... Uh, uh, had flown three different aircraft in three years and combat ready in all three of them. And finally, it was game. My tour was over, the war in Korea was over, and uh, coming to an end. And so uh, I was asked where I wanted to go. Well, the assignment came in that I was going to go to SAC flying fighters. And of course, uh, no one really wanted to go to SAC. Uh, so I had a friend of mine who was a I'd been in personnel, and I said, could you get me an assignment to a, a fighter unit? Or if, if not a fighter unit, I want to go to uh, research development, not to be a test pilot. So uh, a few days later, I came back, that he got me an assignment to Holloman Air Force Base, which is in New Mexico. And it was in a research development command, and it was a place where they did all kinds of testing, uh, missiles and aircraft and uh, and uh, rockets, and uh, that they had the Air Med lab there doing uh, all kinds of interesting stuff. But anyway, I arrived at, at Holland Air Force Base in 1953 uh, and uh, immediately checked out in their aircraft. And at one time in Holland, I was flying 11 different types of airplanes, from the L-19 to the F-104. Uh, those were the golden days of aviation in the Air Force. Uh, today, you could, you, you, they would not allow you to, to fly 11 different airplanes at the same time. Uh, but those, that was the golden uh, age in aviation for the Air Force uh, th th during those years that I was in the Air Force, and particularly at Holloman. I, uh, I flew uh, every airplane that I could fly there. And uh, I, uh, one day, I, about a year after I'd been there, I was. Uh, introduced uh, to a program. My, my squadron commander called us all in and he said, uh, there's a program going on over in the north area led by Dr. Stapp in the Air Med Lab and they're looking for a volunteer. They want somebody to fly zero gravity weightlessness experiments uh, for space and everybody laughed and uh, he said, I need a volunteer. Well, I immediately put my hand up. I looked around the room, and nobody else had their hand up, uh, and I couldn't understand that. But uh, so this, my boss says, uh, "Okay, getting her, uh, you're selected. You go over there and report to Doctor Stapp." So the next day, I went across the field and to, I met Doctor Stapp for the first time, and uh, he he said, "Well, let me tell you this. Uh, I was a lieutenant at the time." He said, "Lieutenant, uh, we're going to go into space." He says, uh, I know it, uh, very few people think we are, but we are going to go into space. And there's a, no, we have very little information that we need physiologically and physically, and uh, there, there's a lot of challenges out there that uh, we need to answer uh, in, in preparation for the space program that will be here pretty soon. Uh, and he said, one of the big questions we have is a weightlessness. Uh, we've, we've not, man has not experienced weightlessness. Uh, on the, the types of duration that it'll have in a space environment. And some people think that you can't survive a long-term weightlessness. They said, we're gonna, we're gonna find out. And I said, yeah, how are we gonna do it? Uh, he said, the only airplane we have here now is a T-33 that we could do it because it had two seats and the back seat would put the subject. And he said, uh, you'll, uh, we'll have a subject in the back seat and uh, you'll take off climb up, put the airplane into a very steep dive, at the maximum speed, pull the airplane up, and get a very 
uh, high angle of attack, uh, maybe 45 degrees uh, above the, the, the horizon. And uh, when you get that established, you push forward on the stick, and we'll have a golf ball on a string. Very sophisticated instrumentation. And he said, when you get to zero gravity, the golf ball is going to be floating right in front of you. And if you get two missed Gs, negative Gs, you'll go high. If you get positive Gs, it'll go down. So all you got to do is just keep that golf ball floating right in front of you. So I said, well, this is like fun. So uh, the next day I started in a T-33 and uh, I went up and practiced the profiles. And the next flight, I had a guy in the back seat with various things to record, respiratory rate and heart rate and, and uh, tasks. He would have to do tasks during the zero gravity. We could get probably uh, oh, 30 seconds of zero gravity uh, duration in the T-33. Uh, we went from the T-33 to the F-94B, the F-94C, the F-89, uh, finally F, the F, F, uh, F-100F, and then the F-104, which uh, could get a prolonged amount of uh, zero gravity. I made over a thousand runs in zero gravity, and uh, uh, it, I, I loved it. And uh, some guy, uh, a doctor, uh, wrote up a paper, and in the paper he said that we cannot go into space because some people get ill and wait is this condition. And that means that we could never put man into space. Well, when I heard about the paper, I went to him and I said, uh, Doctor, uh, why didn't you talk to me? I didn't talk to you about this. Well, he said, we're, we're not, if, if we're going to space, it's not going to be pilots anyway. Probably chimpanzees or monkeys, but uh, he said, uh, I, I'm convinced we cannot uh, put a man in space because of weightlessness. Well, I said, well, sir, I'm convinced we can because I loved it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I was, uh, most fighter pilots would, would be delightful in, in, uh, in zero gravity conditions. So in any event, uh, there was a difference of opinion between the pilot that had flown it and the people that write up about it. Uh, but there's always two sides to every story. But uh, it was a, an awful lot of fun. And Dr. Stappens at that time was working on uh, deceleration. In those days, as a matter of fact, there were more deaths from automobile crashes for Air Force personnel than there were airplane crashes. And Dr. Stapp started a program at Edwards Air Force Base on the sled there uh, looking at restraint devices for uh, people in automobiles. And he, he had a sled program uh, to determine how many G's a person could take negative G's for uh, impact. And that's when he started the program on that, uh, not only for the Air Force survival, but for the uh, uh, automobiles. And he was working on both sides concurrently. Uh, when he went to Holloman, he was made the chief there at MedLab, and he continued his research on deceleration. And one day, he called me into his office, and he said, uh, Lieutenant, he said, we're, we're having a program we're going to do, it. and this, this was in about August. We have a program, we're going to make a sled run in uh, December, and uh, it'll be a human run, and when the countdown starts, it can't be changed, and I want you to be the, the pilot of the uh, chase airplane to take photos of this sled going down the track. And he said, uh, once the countdown starts, you not be changed. So you have to be able to be right there at the right time, at the right place. I said, well, sir, that's a, that's a challenging problem. I need to practice it. So he said, well, okay, you go ahead and practice all you want. So about once a week, I'd schedule an airplane, a T-33, with a photographer in the back. And I would go out and I would practice the track. And what it was, they would say was X minus 5, and then 4, 3, 2, 1. And I'd have to pace myself so that I'd be at the right place at the right time. And I would run around and come down there, and I had about 350 miles an hour right down the deck and uh, at the other track when it was zero. Well, I, I practiced and practiced and practiced from August until December. 
and I never, ever, ever got it perfect down where I was at the right place at the right time. I was always a little bit earlier, a little bit late, but uh, it, it's a very, it, was a, it was a very challenging task to do it, well, just visuals only. So the day before the sled run, Dr. Stepp told me that he was going to be the subject <laughs> in the sled run, which uh, surprised the daylight out of me because I've been working on all these months and had no idea that he was going to be the person who was going to make the sled run. So the next day, uh, I was up there and I guess the countdown started and it was five, four, three, two, one. And I hit the, the only time in all the practices I did, I made hundreds of runs. The only time I was right on the button was that sled run when Dr. Stepp fired with that sled fired. And the track was only 3,500 feet long. He went from zero to, I think, 630 miles an hour. Uh, and then he cozy for a second and hit the brake, the uh, water brakes, and he stopped, and the whole track was at 3,500 feet. So he went from zero, 630, to dead stop at 3,500 feet. And he pulled minus 41 Gs. Uh, he set a new limit to uh, human tolerance to negative Gs. Uh, decisions were made uh, as a result of that exposure that he, that he proved that man could, if he was properly restrained, takes a tremendous amount of G-forces if he was properly in the right position at the right time. Uh, Dr. Stapp was the bravest man I ever knew because he knew physiologically what was going to happen to him. But he did it because he knew that the information was needed and that, 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 that there would be a benefit to future programs. And uh, he was the bravest man I ever met. And I've known a lot of test pilots and fighter pilots, but no one had the courage that that man had. Um, shortly after that, uh, I had made the ejection, that's uh, F-100, and uh, uh, this was in 1958, uh, and uh, Dr. Stepp called me in about a week after that, that ejection, and he said, uh, by this time I was a captain, and he said, Captain, he said, uh, I'm being transferred, I'm going to be the chief of the Air Mental Lab in Dayton, Ohio. And uh, I'd like for you to go there with me and uh, work in the biophysics branch, in the escape division, and uh, take advantage of all your knowledge that you have on the flying and as a jumper. Because I had, well, this time I had uh, uh, five jumps. And uh, so I had just had my life saved uh, by ejection seat uh, the week before. So uh, fate is a hunter. I volunteered to go with Dr. Stapp, and that was a result of my next career movement to Wright Patterson Air Force Base, the biophysics branch. Uh, I was the only fighter pilot uh, in the uh, rescue business. I got my uh, additional jumps uh, for free fall, and I got a, a Navy, uh, my Navy rating for jumping at Del Centro. And, uh, in the biophysics branch, we would test equipment, new parachutes, new survival equipment, new G-suits, uh, centrifuge, altitude chambers. Uh, it was an exciting uh, job uh, testing equipment for the future of air crews and working on problems that they were encountering on escape. And I started studying uh, escape uh, challenges, and I noticed that there were quite a few fatalities on high-altitude escapes. And even all the way back uh, in the 30s, they were having people spinning and tumbling after they jumped out of an aircraft. And uh, I, uh, I started thinking about this as a, boy, this is a challenge. So I studied it quite a bit, and uh, I asked for an appointment with Dr. Stapp. I went over there to his office, and I said, Dr. Stapp, uh, I've been doing some research, and uh, there, there's an area that we really need extensive research on is high altitude escape. And I said, when we go into space, they're going to have astronauts up in that area, and we need to have data for them and for the aircraft that we know they're coming along. The U-2 was coming along, and it was going to be up in those high altitudes, and the SR-71 was coming along. And uh, so I knew that there was a, a that we were going to that altitude range. So Dr. Stapp said, well, 
Captain, uh, you go ahead. Uh, you can do the program. If you have any problems, you let me know. So I then started a program that we named Excelsior. Uh, Dr. Stapp's support uh, was uh, tremendous for me because I, I gathered a team of people, uh, doctors, uh, engineers, uh, sergeants, civilians, uh, and I developed this team to go to a very high altitude. And what any aircraft at that time would get us up to 100,000 feet, but a balloon could. So uh, I selected a, a balloon to go up to 100,000 feet because there wasn't anything else available. Uh, uh, the balloon actually uh, introduced problems that you wouldn't have in an aircraft. Because in an aircraft, in order to fly at that altitude, you have to be at least terminal velocity. So a balloon, and you jump out of a balloon, you have zero velocity. So now you have to free fall from that balloon to total velocity. At 100,000 feet, it takes almost 24 seconds before you're at terminal velocity because you go from zero to terminal. So uh, the, the balloon made it a, some challenges that you, that you didn't have in an aircraft. But I had a great team of people, and uh, I determined that we would use an open gondola because it was simple, it was cheap, uh, it was easy to get out of, and the pressure was going to be in, uh, inflated anyway. So uh, I did about uh, 75 altitude chamber flights up to 110,000 feet. An altitude chamber we had at Wright Field that could get down to minus 100 degrees. Um, so we, we did a, a constant test at the altitude chamber uh, going through the procedures and uh, the checklist, developed a checklist, developing the teamwork that we needed to uh, for the ground crews and uh, to define uh, the, the challenges for pressure suit. Now, I had a full pressure suit. I had the number three full pressure suit. Scott Crossfield had number one, and Bob White had number two, and I had number three. And I did the altitude chamber test, a centrifuge test uh, on, the, on the full pressure suit. And uh, I made the only parachute jump uh, testing the uh, X-15 pressure suit and X-15 parachute. And uh, Scotty Crossfield was a real good friend. Of course, he was a, he was a project engineer for the X-15. And uh, when he found out I was going to use a partial pressure suit, I wanted to use a partial pressure suit because that's what our air crews were going to be using. And I wanted to demonstrate to the air crews that we were giving them very good equipment and that I would bet my life on a full, on the partial pressure suit. So I used it. I used the partial pressure suit because it, it was what the air crews were using, and I wanted to demonstrate to them that we were giving them doggone good equipment. The full pressure suit would have been uh, a lower altitude than the body was at, uh, a lot of advantage for the full pressure suit over the partial pressure suit, but that's the reason why we did it. Uh, at the same time, we were doing a dummy drop test uh, from how under 10,000 feet, and we had cameras in there. And we would drop unstabilized dummies, and we would record the RPM. And we had dummies that reached 200 RPM from 110,000 feet, which would kill a man. So we identified that, boy, high altitude escape is a real challenge. And you, you, that, that you can get very high, high altitude, high RPMs. Now, pilots and astronauts are not skydivers. So right off the bat, we, we, our approach was, we had to have a system that would be uh, compatible for air crews and aircraft and that would take care of them uh, without them having to do anything. So this, we had a, an engineer by the name of Francis Beaupre who developed a five-foot diameter drogue chute uh, that was deployed uh, near terminal velocity and uh, provide enough drag to, to give stabilization to the uh, free-falling uh, subject. Uh, and we used to call the boat pre model stage parachute. And uh, we did a series of dummy drops with it. And I made the first live jump with it from a, a C-130 at 30,000 feet, uh, testing that the first jump that was ever made in that parachute, that parachute, that parachute was from 30,000 feet. And uh, finally in uh, November 
of 1959, we were ready to go. We had worked for a year and a half on the program. I had 13 members on the team. They were all very talented and hardworking, and they were dedicated to get me up and down the lot and to come up with a, a escape system for future air crews and astronauts that would get them down from uh, at least 100,000 feet. Uh, I went to, we went to Holland Air Force Base, where the, the balloon launch crew was, and uh, in uh, November I uh, launched the, the uh, balloon. I went up to 77,000 feet, and I started to get up, and I was trapped in the seat. And uh, I, I couldn't imagine why it was, uh, this was happening to me, but uh, I, I, I finally wrenched myself out of the seat, and in doing so, I started a timer going inadvertently. And the timer was set to run for 16 seconds, which was very about three quarters of a turn of velocity. But because I had pulled the timer before it was supposed to be pulled, I only fell two and a half seconds, and the small drogue chute deployed and came out and lacking sufficient velocity to deploy properly, wandered around and wrapped around my neck. And I immediately just discovered that I didn't have a stabilization parachute. And I knew it was going to be a very interesting fall because I had seen the photos of the dummies that didn't have stabilization, uh, what happened to them. But I started free falling and uh, face to earth and I, I I was doing pretty good. As a matter of fact, I said to myself, I said, self, it looks like we'll be able to skydive all the way down. And uh, about that time, I started turning to the right, and I, I stopped it. Then I started turning to the left, and I stopped it. And then I had a final entry into the right, and it spun me up. Uh, and, I, and my left wrist had a lot of terror on a stopwatch. And I wanted to uh, see what altitude I was at, how long I'd fallen, because by this time I'd forgotten how long it was, but the G-force was so great I couldn't pull my arm in. And very shortly after that, I passed out. And uh, I came to at 10,000 feet. My reserve parachute had deployed, and uh, I was coming down with my reserve parachute open. I, I was, my life was saved by that emergency parachute because I was unconscious because of the, G, of the G-forces. I had, we announced these in the film after the jump, uh, the kid, I went 120 RPM when I passed out, uh, which was a pretty high uh, RPM. And uh, I landed, and we discovered why the problem had happened, and uh, we over fixed the problem. It was, uh, the, the kit was wedged uh, too tight in the seat. And uh, a month later, I went back. But before that, I had to go up in front of General Schriever, who was the commander of the Research Development Command. And uh, I said, you know, General Schriever, my jump proved why we need to develop that chute. I, I demonstrated what would happen to a pilot if he bailed out at 77,000 feet. Uh, and if, if I was just lucky, I'm still alive because I had a reserve parachute. Pilots don't have reserve parachutes. But that jump showed why. We, we need to do our program. So he said, okay, Kelly, one more time, go ahead. So I went back out there a month later in December and went up to 77,000 feet and everything went perfect. It was a perfect jump. Uh, the stabilization parachute worked just the way it was designed. It was a great jump, no problems, no uh, nothing that, that we encountered that we had not anticipated. So now it's time for the jump from 100,000 feet. And uh, now, and then this jump, by the way, the pressure full, the partial pressure suit would inflate at 40,000 feet. And it would keep the body at 40,000 feet. And uh, so when I hit 40,000 feet going up, uh, I, I flexed the uh, arms and legs and so forth to see if the pressure suit was inflated. And it was inflated and it was working just with the design. And I checked my booties and then I checked my gloves and I discovered that my right glove was not inflated. And there's nothing I could do about that. Now, we had never, man had never been into a vacuum with his hand like that and unpressurized. So I was going to an area that really we, we didn't have any experience of. Uh, and 
and I knew that my hand was going to swell up and uh, could be painful. But uh, I knew that if I told the ground crew, the doctor there on the ground, that I didn't have a pressure glove on my right hand, he would have told, insisted I abort the mission. Well, I didn't want to do that because I wasn't certain that we could continue going. We were low on funds, so I didn't tell anybody. And what happened is my hand did swell up into a silk glove that we always wore over the hand and then into the pressure suit. And it, as my hand swelled, it actually pressurized itself. But I couldn't use the right hand. But in any event, I, the balloon climbed up to 102,800 feet. And uh, the, uh, guy on the guy on the ground said, uh, Joe, we need you to float for about uh, 11 minutes because we're not quite over the exact spot for the jump. So I stayed there 11 minutes at 102,800 feet as the balloon slowly drifted over the jump point. Uh, the uh, guy on the ground finally said, okay, Joe, it's time to start. So I had a checklist that was uh, 46 items on the checklist, and I went through the checklist. I stood up, uh, said a prayer, pushed the button to start the cameras running, and jumped. Uh, I uh, was face to earth, of course, uh, when I jumped, and uh, I, I rolled over my back. I looked up, and the blue was just firing into space. I couldn't believe how fast that blue was going up. And then I realized that the blue was steady, and it was me going down at a fantastic rate. Um, and then shortly after that, my drogue chute, my five-foot diameter drogue chute deployed, and uh, uh, the, the, the jump, which lasted four minutes and 36 seconds, was uneventful. I could control the parachute perfectly. I had no spinning problems. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was just a classic jump. Uh, so when I landed, my ground crew was there. Uh, we were all extremely happy because we had worked a year and a half on the goal. We had, so, we had shown that man could, in fact, uh, go to 102,800 feet in a pressure suit and then jump out and uh, escape. So uh, we, 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 we showed that one, that man could work in space, and two, that we could provide a means of escape. Now, that drogue chute was incorporated into the escape systems for future airplanes. And in 1966, there was a guy named Bill Weaver who was in an SR-71, and it came out of control. The airplane disintegrated. He got thrown out of the cockpit. Uh, the small drogue chute deployed. And uh, he was unconscious, but he, he, he survived uh, the, the, the jump. And uh, he told me that he survived because of uh, a, a robust pressure suit and a small drogue chute and uh, the will of God. Uh, but uh, that, that was a, a jump that was at 3.18 Mach at about 80,000 feet. And it was uh, the fastest ejection ever made. Uh, free fall ever made from uh, that's pretty high altitudes uh, that, that he was at the SR-71. The, uh, the next program way that I was involved with was called Stargazer. Uh, we had a uh, eight foot diameter gondola at right field that was a pressurized gondola and I was called by uh, the Dearborn Observatory and uh, asked if uh, I was interested in such a program and the idea was, was to take a, an astronomer up in, a, in this balloon above the Earth's atmosphere so we could look at the stars and so forth without the effect of turbulence that, that we have in, in our atmosphere. You know, stars don't twinkle. Uh, they twinkle because of the, of the haze and turbulence between us and, a, and the vacuum of space. So if you get in a balloon and get above all this turbulence, then you have a much better medium to look at the stars and planets. In any event, I worked five years in that program. Uh, it was with Smithsonian, it was with MIT, uh, developed, MIT developed the stabilization system for the uh, telescope and the star tracker. And uh, I had a great team of people, but it took five years to do this program. Uh, I had a great uh, astronomer by the name of Bill White, and it, we he and I took off from Holland Air Force Base and went up to 87,000 feet. And 
the scientist, by the way, on this program was a fellow by the name of Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who ended up to be on the uh, uh, UFO expert uh, in later years. So Stargazer was uh, an interesting program. Uh, there was a lot of people who said we shouldn't do it. Uh, because in, in the real world, there's a lot of people that are, that are put barricade obstacles in the way of research programs. Uh, you have to accept the fact that, that research is a, is a delicate subject for some people, and it's got to do with dollars and so forth. But uh, the only reason we could do Stargazer was because of Dr. Stapp. Uh, when I went to him, I said, well, he, he said to me, Joe, uh, will the Air Med Lab get anything out of the Stargazer program? He said, well, sir, we're using a new automatic clothes uh, helmet. Uh, there'd be some small uh, contributions, but for basic research, it's a, it's a fantastic thing for astronomy and for astronomers. And so he said, well, let's do it. And he's probably the only chief of a, of a, of a big lab that would say that. That would say, do research because it's going to help other people. But that's, that's the kind of man Dr. Stapp was. So he said, Joe, you go ahead and do it. So we, we had trouble getting funding, and the only reason we did it was because of Dr. Stapp. So we went up in, in uh, 1962, December, on Stargazer, and it was a very successful flight. Um, we uh, landed with fabulous data. Uh, we looked at stars that, without the atmosphere uh, interfering. At the same time we had on the ground, we had another telescope looking at the same target that we were looking at in the air. So we had a control. We had a, a, a ground-based telescope looking at the same targets, and then and then we were looking at that target from above the atmosphere. So it, it was a very interesting program. Um, but what happened was Dr. Stepp got transferred. So they were my support. So when it came time to make the second and third and fourth and fifth Stargazer of flight, uh, I could not get the funds to do it. So the program was terminated because we didn't have Dr. Stapp to support it. And it was really a, a sad thing that it happened because uh, it, was a, it was a very valuable program that, that provided, was providing tremendous information to astronomers uh, at a very cheap price. Uh, there was never as much data collected until the Hubble telescope, but the Hubble cost billions of dollars to do. And our, uh, our Bloom program was peanuts compared to uh, the, the, the space programs that were uh, subsequently used. So here was a program I worked on for five years, and after one flight it was, it was terminated. I was really disappointed. Uh, and about that time the war in Vietnam was starting, so uh, I went and volunteered to go to Vietnam to the Air Commandos. So I left from right field in, in 1963 and went to Herbert Field where I went, became a fighter pilot again. And uh, I checked, I was flying the B-26. They had uh, uh, two airplanes that had guns, the uh, B-26 and the uh, T-28 and the A-1E as a matter of fact. Uh, we had three airplanes with guns and drop bombs and so forth. And the B-26 was one. I had flown the airplane before in Harleman, so when I got the Air Commandos, they assigned me the B-26. Uh, and in July of 1963, I went to Vietnam. I was there until April of 1964, and came back to the States. And uh, I went back to Vietnam in '66. So uh, my tour in uh, at the headquarters in the Stuttgart in Germany was coming to an end, and uh, the war in uh, Vietnam was still going on. So I felt an obligation to go back and, and do my part. Uh, so I volunteered to go back to Vietnam, and uh, this time uh, in an F-4 Phantom jet. So after a year's training, uh, I went back to Vietnam in uh, uh, it's the April of 1971, and uh, I was made the squadron commander of uh, the Triple Nickel, 
uh, attack fighter squadron, which, by the way, we shot down more MiGs than any other fighter squadron in, in uh, Vietnam, including the Navy. But uh, I, uh, I, I flew, uh, I had a, uh, the, the thing any fighter pilot wants to do is to be a squadron commander in a combat situation. And uh, I was very fortunate to be in that position. I had uh, 26 uh, F-4s, Ds under my command and 400 some odd men, uh, fighter pilots and uh, navigators in the back end of the aircraft. And uh, I, uh, on the uh, May the 11th, 1972, uh, I was leading a MiG cap over North Vietnam, and uh, on my 483rd uh, combat mission, uh, and uh, oh, a thousand hours of combat, and uh, I got shot down by a MiG-21 that uh, came up undetected from my rear end, and the next thing I was, uh, I knew that uh, I was going Mach 2 chasing a MiG, when all of a sudden I was uh, ejecting at 18,000 feet and disabled tumbling F-4, and uh, I ejected and uh, at Mach 1 at 18,000 feet. And of course, before I went out my back seat, I ejected him when I pulled the uh, handle for the ejection. And uh, so one minute I'm doing Mach 2 over North Hanoi, and uh, uh, the next minute I'm in a parachute coming down uh, over a big rice paddy. When I landed, I was immediately pounced on by about 100 uh, people that were working in the fields, and uh, I was quickly bundled up and taken to Hanoi, where I spent uh, 11 months as a POW. And uh, finally, in March of 1973, we were all released, and I came home. I spent a year at the Air, Air War College, and then I went to uh, England uh, to fly uh, F-4s at uh, Lake Heath as a vice wing commander. Uh, after three years there, I came back and uh, spent uh, uh, another tour at a headquarters and I decided to retire from the Air Force. Uh, I came back to Orlando and uh, I met this fellow by the name of Bob Snow who uh, had a dining and entertainment complex in Orlando and he asked me to come and work for him and uh, finally I did after couple of years with Mark Marietta as an engineer on the Persian missile. And uh, I, uh, he asked me to come and work for him, which uh, flying circus, uh, we had five airplanes uh, uh, that we uh, did sky riding and banner towing with. And Bob and I flew balloons all over the world, Lithuania and Russia and Italy and Australia and uh, just having a, a ball of flying hot air balloons and helium balloons and races. Um, when I was in solitary confinement at Tenoy, uh, I had kept myself entertained by uh, designing a how to fly around the world solo in a balloon. And I designed the, the whole system uh, mentally. So when I got back, uh, I went to a friend of mine, Ed Yost, and I said, uh, Ed, I want to fly around the world solo in a balloon. So. Uh, I couldn't find a sponsor, so we finally uh, I decided, well, I'll just fly across the Atlantic, which had not been done by that time in a balloon solo. So uh, I put together a program uh, to fly across the Atlantic Ocean solo with the hopes that this would get me a sponsor that I could uh, entice to finance me flying around the world in a balloon. So I took off in uh, September of the 14th in 1982, and uh, I flew uh, across the ocean to uh, Italy, where I landed uh, after a flight of 3,600 miles in uh, 84 hours, and uh, became the first person to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean. And it was just for fun. It was just to set records and to have a lot of fun. And uh, there was no scientific reason for doing it. It was just something that was an adventure that uh, needed to be done. And uh, I, I did it, had a lot of fun accomplishing it. Um, I'd like to stop now and go back and answer a couple more questions about uh, uh, the, uh, my background. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, 
that I uh, have an opportunity to be an astronaut. And uh, let me let me talk about a minute about that a minute. First of all, the space program really didn't get started until 1960 with NASA. Uh, we were doing our work prior to the space program ever being started. We were doing research to prepare for space, and the information we found was of value to to NASA. Uh, and in about 1961, uh, they uh, came up with the start with the astronaut program, the Mercury program, the Mercury selection program. And a notice went out to all test pilots and uh, others that uh, they were taking volunteers for the space program for flight. Um, I uh, studied the proposal and uh, I thought it would be an interesting thing to do, so I set up a meeting with Dr. Stapp and we discussed uh, what NASA object was. And uh, Dr. Stapp told me, he said, well, Joe, he said, I, I think that if you volunteered for it, that you would probably get selected because you've got the qualifications that they're looking for. And he said, I'm, I'm pretty sure you would get selected if you volunteered for it um, because of your background and what you've done already. And then I thought about it, and I said, well, you know, Dr. Stapp, uh, I've been working now for two years on these programs that I'm working on, and I'm, I'm thoroughly engrossed in the Stargazer program, and, uh, and Dr. Stapp said, well, you're right, Joe, and he said, if you left, it would probably take a couple of years before we could get these programs going again. So I decided that uh, what I had uh, was doing was probably a, a more benefit to the space program anyway, so I decided I opted not to volunteer for the uh, astronaut program. I think I'd have had a chance. But uh, I, I was, I think that the contribution that, that we made, Dr. Stapp and the Air Med Lab and my team and I, were well worth not volunteering for the uh, NASA uh, astronaut program. And I never regretted it. I never looked back and said, I should have done this or should have done that. Uh, the decision I made was correct. And uh, the uh, astronauts did a phenomenal job. They were all brave people. Most of them were fighter pilots. And... Uh, they, they did a fantastic job uh, in, in that space program and advanced our, our knowledge of the heavens. Um, another question that was asked was, uh, uh, just, just a second. The uh, uh, Red Bull Stratus. Oh, well, I uh, after my jump, uh, I got phone calls and, and emails and letters from people all around the world at least once a month. I'm sorry they wanted to beat my record. Um, I, uh, I I turned them down for my involvement because uh, most of them had no idea of the, the dangers and the, what it required to do it. And uh, I turned them down uh, because uh, I, I didn't want to be involved in something somebody get killed. And then uh, I got a phone call from the... Uh, CEO of uh, David Clark said so they were having a, a group coming in from Red Bull that wanted to discuss the possibility of a, a jump from to beat my record, and he wanted me to come up there and, uh, and sit there and listen to the proposal. Um, so I did that, and I went to uh, Worcester, Mass, and uh, I uh, listened to the uh, proposal and. Uh, their goals were correct. They were looking to do it in a safe manner and in a methodical manner that uh, I thought was the way to do it. And the Red Bull was a substantial organization and had the finances to, uh, to uh, do such a program. So uh, I had a meeting with uh, the uh, David Clark people and I said, well, I think that uh, this is a valid program. So uh, I volunteered uh, to go to work with Red Bull and help on the program. I spent five years on the program. Uh, I was uh, constantly going to California to help with uh, Hart Thompson with the uh, capsule and the balloon and the parachute and uh, pressure suits. And uh, I spent five years as a consultant. And uh, a lot of this time was spent with uh, Felix, uh, who, by the way, lived in Austria. 
which uh, made it difficult for us because here we were trying to design a capsule and a, a system for him, and he wasn't there to go along with us. So uh, that, that was a disadvantage for him not being there all the time. But uh, we had a great uh, project director, Art Thompson, and uh, he, he was a, a great leader, a very patient man and uh, methodical. And uh, as I said, we worked for five years uh, before we were able to do it. Uh, we finally went out to uh, Rosa, New Mexico in uh, 2012 and uh, made the three jumps. The last jump was from 127,000 feet. Um, we had a great team uh, working together on the program. Um, and uh, he went up in the last jump to 128,000 feet. He reached a speed of 828 miles an hour, Mach 1.28, and uh, set several world records for free falling. Uh, we had a great team of people working together that made it happen. Uh, we got him, our goal from the very beginning was to get him up there and get him down safely, and we did that. So that we, we accomplished the objectives that we were after, that I was after, was get him down safely. And uh, it was a free fall record from uh, space that uh, was broken a couple of years later by a fellow by the name of uh, Alan Eustace. And uh, he went up 10,000 feet higher than uh, Felix. But Felix holds the record for the first uh, free fall from a uh, space environment. Uh, I think that covers the uh, Stratus program. Yes. Uh, so going through some of the questions here, uh, there was a question about the nose cone uh, of a Redstone missile. Oh. Well, after the uh, Manhattan program, uh, a program came up that was called MISS, M-I-S-S. -S. And uh, this was a program that, which stood for Man in Space Soonest. So Dr. Stapp and I and uh, Dave Simons went to Redstone Arsenal and had a, uh, a meeting with uh, Von Braun. Von Braun was the chief of the uh, Army uh, uh, rocket program at Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, we had a long discussion with doc Dr. Uh, Von Braun. And the idea being we were going to use a Redstone missile and uh, go into space uh, very quick because it was a very reliable missile that they had. And uh, the Air Force was going to provide the uh, capsule and uh, the uh, astronauts. And uh, I was looking forward to being one of the first persons to fly in space using that, that program. But it was a joint program with the Army and the Air Force. And uh, the uh, uh, generals in charge of the Army and the Air Force decided that no, they didn't want to do a joint program. so. The program was canceled, and this was before NASA got started. Uh, we, I think we had a darn good chance of beating the Russians if we had gone ahead with that program. It was a, it was a program that I think would have gotten us in space a year before the uh, Russians did it, but unfortunately the, the program was canceled. Very good. One of the last questions I have here, which is probably one of the better questions here, let me just read it to you and let you kind of think about it. In many people's eyes, your achievements would make you an aviation legend. Are there any leading figures in aviation from the past or that you have met who would be your personal heroes? Well, one of the people that I really respected was a fellow by the name of Bob Hoover, who is a, uh, an Air Force pilot, an experimental test pilot, and a, a great acrobatic pilot. Uh, he was a, a phenomenal man and a gentleman. And a great aviator, he died a few years ago. But uh, he was a, an idol, and I would see him quite frequently at various functions. And uh, he was a person that I admired uh, because of his uh, background and what he had contributed to aviation. Very good. Of course, the bravest man I ever met was Dr. Stapp. Hmm. Uh, what he did, he knew what the results, his physical reserves were going to be. And he took that chance anyway because he knew that we needed that data for the future and for uh, the pilots of today and tomorrow. So uh, he was the bravest man that I ever met. And I met an awful lot of fighter pilots and brave, brave people, but he, was, he stands out as the most brave 
person I ever met. Yeah, and there's a great book out there, Sonic Wind, which I believe you you sent me a copy of that book, which is. Yeah, there is. There's, there's a very good book about Dr. Step called Sonic Wind, written by Craig uh, Ryan. Yeah, perfect. Well, Joe, on behalf of the Rural Aeronautical Society, thank you so much for sitting down and capturing some of this uh, on tape. Is there anything else that you wanted to kind of put on file? Well, I think it, uh, the, the, one of the rules that I had uh, in uh, life was uh, on the project that I did, and some of them were, had never been done before, was you needed three ingredients. Uh, you had to have confidence in your equipment, confidence in your team, and confidence in yourself. And I had that in all the programs that I did. I always surrounded myself with people that were smarter than I was and uh, had the same goal to get me up and down safely. And, uh, but those three ingredients are very important. Confidence in yourself, the three C's I call them, and confidence in your equipment and confidence in the uh, team. It takes all three work together. And I think that was one of the, the rules that I had, the golden rules that I had uh, in the research that I did where I was doing things that were potentially dangerous, uh, but uh, I surrounded myself with a great team of people. And what I did was nothing, because without that team, I could have done nothing. That's what it takes is a real good team, the same objectives that, we, that I had. Very good. On that note, thank you, Colonel. Is that, did, yeah, we, did we get all the it. questions? I think we got everything, yeah. Good.